Good morning and uh, good afternoon. This is Monica Paolini from uh, Senza Fili. And um, today we're talking about uh, NFV and the long-term implications of, of it and um, what, what it means for uh, op operators. And one of them, a, a major um, uh, uh, a major implication is that uh, um, with NFV, we have an increase in complexity. Networks are not getting any easier, they're getting more complex. How do we deal with that? And I'm talking about this uh, today with Bruce Kelly. He's the CTO and the SVP of Service Provider uh, Business Operations at NetScout. Uh, Bruce, thanks for being with us today. Hello, Monica. I'm glad to be here. So let's just get started. Uh, complexity. Uh, where is it coming from and uh, um, how do we deal with it? Yeah, CSPs around the globe today are in the middle of uh, digital transformation. Monica, as you know, that's the move to all software, which has been quite disruptive. And the complexity challenge really comes around the re-architecture of the data center and what we call the software-defined data center. Absolutely. So. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, um, what, what does complexity involve? Where, where is it coming from? Let me first start with what NetScout's been doing. I think that's important to understand. So NetScout has spent $3 billion in the last three years. And what we've been doing is transforming ourselves into a software company. And the role that we're going to play in the software-defined data center and be at the core of the 5G edge is what we term visibility without borders. Visibility without borders. That sounds uh, uh, very, very cool. But what, what, is, uh, what is the visibility into? Glad you asked. Great the questions. borders. Okay, let's just get... Well, let's start simple. Let's start with one of the first challenges that you get hit with in the, in the SDDC, Software Defined Data Center. So the first challenge is you're not going to throw away the existing network, right? You have the existing router switches and three-tiered routing designs of core aggregation and access, which is very good for not self-traffic. And what you're doing is you're starting to now build cloud in the data center, on-prem cloud, and you'll choose OpenStack or VMware. And when you do that, immediately a dynamic happens where the traffic flows completely change. And so when you move into a OpenStack environment, for example, 80% of your traffic is now going to go east-west, right? And so the challenge you have is now you're blind. And so visibility without borders, the first border is around total visibility. I want to see the physical network, north-south. And I want to see the, the new part of the data center, which is east-west, which is the communication between workloads and virtual machines. Absolutely. So th that, in that increases the comp overall complexities because the old stuff is not going away, but you have more uh, of new components, new things that you have to keep in mind. So um, how can you, um, how, what are you, how are you dealing with that? How does an operator deal with that? So uh, with, with visibility without borders, what NetScout's doing is one, we're relevant at every layer of the data center. So maybe it's easier for me to talk about the data center in layers so we can in, in see, get a clear picture into that. So what I would call layer one, I mentioned earlier, which is the physical network. You get MPLS, Ethernet, your routers, your switches, your existing stuff. And what NetScout's doing at layer one is we move to a software model. So even if you were in the physical network, we would run our software on COTS. And that would bring down the total cost of ownership, number one because you have traffic exploding even in that network today. So it needs to be affordable. So there's visibility without borders. So it's not just visibility, but affordable visibility. Then you start to go up to layer one, where I mentioned you're picking a stack, picking a cloud, and now you're going east-west. And so we're software, and we've intelligently designed our products so that we work in and have certified in OpenStack, VMware, private clouds. We've also certified in public clouds like AWS, Azure, Google. But uh, pick your cloud, it's, it's visibility at the north, south, east, west layer. Then once you've picked and designed uh, the cloud, the next step, which is happening today, NFV has been very slow to be implemented. And so we're starting to see virtual IMS, virtual EPC, virtual SBC. So these are services, the virtual services that run on the, the, the private stack that you picked. And so NetScale plays, I call that layer. Three, so we're simply watching the PC, watching edge that's getting virtualized. And then the last layer in the data center, the fourth layer, is really all around automation. The reason why they're doing this, they're trying to automatically roll out services, elastically scale the network. And so the role we're playing, like I said, is visibility about borders. Well, all these borders, the first set is each layer in this new data center design, physical, virtual, virtualized services, 
automation where relevant at all those layers and can give insights to the CSP to make sure everything is uh, giving a good customer experience and operating at the, the optimal performance. Absolutely. So you're able to work within each layer and then provide unified vision so that they have visibility and they can act on it. And then, so for instance, for automation, you need to have all the information about the, the layers below so that you can automate. One and of the key that. things that we're doing, Monica, is when we say visibility without borders, we're, what we're really doing is generating, we're sitting in all these layers, one given visibility. But the second thing we're do, doing is we're producing smart data that's actionable. And so the end result is what we call NetScout being the smart data company, right? We happen to be solving all these challenges that you talk about, which are these borders of, you know, not being blind, having visibility everywhere all the time, any network and it, any service. Uh, but really at the end of the day, what we want is actionable smart data. And the actionable smart data that we're doing really falls into three kind of use case areas that, that we're helping the CSPs today. The first one is a uh, bread and butter business, which is service assurance. And we're just taking service assurance from the physical world to the virtual world. Okay, so it's a unified data model, smart data model, end to end. Uh, the second area we use smart data, we're expanding our total addressable market is we've done some acquisitions and in that acquisition, we picked up Arbor, which owns 50% of the security DDoS market. So they're gonna leverage smart data and which is end to end unified model. And so we're gonna be doing security as well as service assurance and then the industry trend, the last trend that's really hot right now is people want to take smart data and do their own analytics. So that the CSPs have their own big data projects where they're doing marketing intelligence, all forms of uh, analytics. And so we've opened up the APIs when we're getting visibility across all these borders. We use an industry standard API so that from that single investment, which is our uh, VStream product running, giving visibility without borders, they're able to do service assurance, security, and big data. And so then it's all within the same framework. So they can pull together, you know, you get the, the smart data, but it's used for different purposes at the and, same and, time. And the big thing here is consolidation and mm -hmm. lower total cost of ownership. So the days are gone where you put four or five vendors probes on, on a link, one for security, one for service assurance. But we're saying, no, there's one instrumentation point that produces smart data. And from that one instrumentation, that one vendor, it's a unified model that can apply to all those. So the cost comes down significantly. Absolutely. And uh, in, sort of in terms of cost and the sort of uh, operations uh, uh, leanness, um, can you, uh, how can you work with different vendors? Because operators, uh, as they, the more virtualized they are, the more likely they are to have different, to rely on different vendors, different solutions, and again, also that different networks. Uh, um, how can you help them with that? Yeah, so that's, that's one of the beauties of Netscope Solutions. So um, we, we have 50% of the service assurance market. So we've seen all the vendors, the Huawei's, the Ericsson's, the Nokia's. So we already work in those networks today for 3G and 4G, even 2G. So when we go to 5G, which is one, one of the things we're seeing here, it's disruptive because they go into a software model. But at the end of the day, these are 3GPP standards that we follow. They don't always follow the standard, but we're in all the tier one operators around the globe. So we're tier one battle tested, if you will. And so one of the advantages of smart data, not only is it end-to-end, -end, but it's multi-vendor, right? So it's, it, that's already been proven. And then as the roadmap can, continues, you got Wi-Fi and someday maybe 6G, but we've been following that trend with roadmap for quite some time. Absolutely. So you're, you're you know, so multiple vendors, multiple layers, but also there is increasingly multiple locations with edge yeah. computing. Uh, that's, that's yet another dimension, something new that you have to deal with in order to get visibility and manage your network. That's yet another border. So, you've, you've yes. so, so the, the thing with the edge that's very interesting is that the edge doesn't have all this major compute power like a main data center, right? You're going to be in the local towns, local COs. And so the technology choice, the way they're architecting the edge is much different than the core. And what do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is if you look at the virtualization in the core, they got workloads that were virtual machine based. And the virtual machines are heavy, need more compute. And so the way they're designing the edge now is they're using the Google's Kubernetes technology and containers, which is lighter weight. And so when you look at NetScout's visibility without borders, our VStream product, which is what gives visibility, it can run as a container, a Docker container in a Docker workload. And so it's seen east west out at the edge. If it was a workload that was in the core is virtual machine, the VStream product can run as a virtual machine and sit and watch the east-west visibility, what I call workload visibility. And we also provide visibility between workloads. And so 
but uh, it's also what we talked about multi-vendor was one we talked about multi-cloud here we're talking about just multi-architecture vm versus container and that's just yet another border that we we've, we've solved today this is shipping all the things i'm talking about are, are shipping today and shipping products from netsco and I guess that also sort of indirectly uh, you alluded to the fact to the to the dynamic chain nature of the networks. The networks keep changing, so you need to offer so service providers a, a solution that is able to cope with change with the dynamic nature of our networks. Our goal really is to accelerate the digital transformation, and how we're doing that is through visibility, and we're doing that whether it's the old or the new. Mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 what we call service assurance continuity. So. Let's take an example. We have Carrier X in the US, and we have uh, approximately 3,000 users logged in daily, looking at the RAN, looking at the core, looking at IMS. Their workflows, when they go to 5G, which may be completely in the software part of the data center, don't change at all. It's transparent to them. It's the way we installed our product that might have changed, but the 3,000 users don't need to be retrained. And so this is powerful because they really care about the end of the day. What was the quality of the voice call? They don't care if it went over Wi-Fi, went over 3G. They care about if it went over Wi-Fi and it was bad, then, then they would care. But in general, our job is to make it transparent to the big data people, the service assurance people, the security people, um, and that's the power of the visibility without borders solution. Yeah. Now, the, the, the visibility without borders, that's a, that's a cool idea, but uh, in reality, operators have a lot of internal borders uh, within different groups. Uh, is your solution going to be able to address that in, in, in a sense that the different teams also need to work with each other? It, yep. It's more than just a solution. In, in, it's, a, it's a cultural difference, uh, if you wish, if you will. I, I think it's, it's through the value that we can bring. So some examples, is I can think of a North American carrier that we're dealing with right now. We have, one, we cut their cost by over 100 million just by consolidating vendors and going to software, right? So that was one, and we went nationwide. So it was 30 plus data centers. And then the second thing that we did is we, we were typically working with operations and engineering, which was one of the silos, one of the groups, and they're the primary user of our product. Well, it, it turns out that there were four big data products, uh, projects that were going on. One was around marketing. Another one was data monetization. Another one was executive reporting of all the new technologies being rolled out. And so what we were able to do from that existing investment that was already made was open up the smart data interfaces to these projects. So the value was there. And so when there's value, then you can get communication going between the groups. If there's no real value, uh, and the value was very specific, like marketing was getting what they wanted, executives were getting what they wanted, operation engineering. So it was different use cases off of that uh, investment, which saved them a ton of money uh, by doing the consolidation to begin with. So out of curiosity, do you have, when you go and start working with, with or continue working, probably in your case, with, with an operator, do they go for the, do they, the need for visibility, does it come from a specific part of your organization first, or is it coming from the all, all of them at the same time? Uh, well, it ends up all at the same time, but where we started our company and grew it to 50% of the market was we really were dealing with engineering and operations, mm -hmm. people building the network, building 5G. So... We would be involved, for example, get 5G coming out. So the role NetScout will play with visibility is all phases of the life cycle of 5G. So what are the phases? So there's the pre-launch, the design phase. You know, we're actually doing drive testing for the North American carriers right now. Mm -hmm. right? We're producing data that allows them to, to, to determine where do I put 5G, right? And so drive test business we have is one part. Then they take that data and they do modeling and the analytics off of that. Then they start to roll out a market it, it, with engineering design and they test it end to end. So when you look at our tool bag, there's a tool for the RAN planner, there's a tool for the engineer that needs to see end to end. It, can, I, can I attach to the network? Can I authenticate? Can I set up policies? Can I do the whole call model on a test basis? Then they start to roll out field friendly, friendly uh, trials where we start to monitor key performance indicators and more real time monitoring. And then all the way around to the market is up and it's launched and hey, we want to continuously watch the help. So we're doing automation and analytics around how do you optimize something that's already running? And so the way we look at this is there's a, a right tool at the right time in the tool bag, and it's going across many different groups, RAN, core, operations, engineering, uh, planning, and so on. Yeah, so, and it's, it's going on now. Now with 5G, what is going to change from your point of view and from an operator point of view? Yeah, so it's 5G is extremely, um, 
disruptive. So there's a lot of opportunity with 5G, right? They can go in, sell to connected cars, smart cities, new ways to get revenue. But the technology really around automation is complex. Um, there's a lot of uh, competing standards, even in open source, you've got two competing standards, ONAP and uh, Etsy Mano with OSM, uh, just to do uh, automation, which is needed with 5G, as you've got the edge and edge computing and lots of locations, you're gonna wanna automate the network um, scaling in and out in, on the edges. And then you look at the vendors, where are the vendors? Where is Nokia, where is Ericsson, where is Huawei? They're trying to survive. They went from physical EPC to virtual EPC, physical IMS to virtual IMS. And they're not really worried about open source own app that's email right now. They're worried about, can I sell virtual IMS and then I'm gonna automate my own VNF. And once they accomplish that, maybe a year or uh, two from now, they'll start to go into the uh, open source standards. So right now there's a little bit of chaos um, happening, uh, but the move to software has definitely started. NFV is picking up. And I think the driver of that is 5G. And it's really because you can't afford not to use software when you go in 5G, when you start to do edge computing. Absolutely, yeah, because otherwise the risk is that you're not, you're not able to take advantage of the technology. You might have a 5G network that is not you won't be able to delivering on the promises. So you need to, you need to make sure and work around it, uh, on it. Um, do you see any difference in terms of the, the response or what you hear from operators for, for different regions? Who, who's going, who is yeah, more aggressive? 5G, um, yes, each country is different. So some countries like up in Canada, for example, don't even have spectrum yet. The auctions haven't happened. So they can play in their lab, but they really can't sell anything to a customer. Here in North America, you can. So North America is very aggressive. When you look at its public information, you can look at AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile are going head to head, choosing what cities, what markets. They're getting very specific in the press, in what time frames, what markets first. If you look um, internationally, Korea, uh, people like LG Plus, uh, KT, very aggressive, right? And so in Netscale, we're selling to 90% of the tier ones around the globe. So typically when there's a new technology like 5G, we have, we're involved with someone who's going first. And whether it's in Asia Pac, North America, it really doesn't matter. And 5G is just one of the things. You also have NBIOT is pretty hot right now. And so we have one customer all the time going first and then others wait and, and they let it mature. Absolutely. So actually, what is um, IoT bringing in in terms of you know, new challenges? Because it's a new traffic types, and new, requir new requirements in terms of performance. So again, that's another, another level of uh, uh, more complexity. Uh, how is that uh, um, working for you? Yeah, so IoT is a challenge in the sense that you, you can end up with billions of things over time, right? And so when you've got a gateway, so there's limited resources. So the traditional way of a mobile phone coming in, keeping context in a gateway, that's pretty heavy. And so what they're doing with IoT, you might have a meter, and what they're doing is basically sending small messages in some cases over user plane, over control plane links. So it sounds kind of strange, but there happens to be an interface for the technical folks out there called S11U. And that used to be a control plane rank, a link, right? Only control plane went over it, now user plane's going over it. And the reason is it's lightweight. They want to use control plane that's lightweight. They don't want big contexts in the gateways and routers so they can service millions of things. So for NetScout, what this means is we have a very uh, flexible system. We just wrote a smart data plugin. So with a smart data company, we write smart data plugins. We wrote a plugin for Apple, for Apple Pay. We got one for American Express. We're watching credit card. We're watching Volte plugins. So now there's a, a plugin for uh, narrow band IoT. And we just did this for some North American carriers. And what this gives them when we write a plugin is complete visibility, right? It's visibility at the KPI level, key performance indicators. They can look at individual sessions of individual devices, and they can go all the way down to the packet level. Absolutely. And that also opens the, the you know, you're probably going to start working more and more with all these other providers, part, the part of the ecosystem that are not just operators. Uh, uh, they're not going to be, there's going to be way, way more than that, especially as the enterprise gets, becomes more, uh, involved, like for instance, with private networks. Another key area that we didn't discuss when we say 5G mm -hmm. is network slicing. All right. So this is a big deal, right? So this is finally telco is doing something. They've been virtualizing it really networks in 20 years. We had a VLAN. Now what you really have a network slice is I can have all my mobile phones on one network slice, one network. Now, and, and that's what we're doing today. Now maybe I want to expand it to connected cars and I don't want the phones on the same network as 
connected cars for obvious reasons, right? So this is a huge opportunity for the telcos to go into every vertical, whether they're going into smart cities, whether they're dealing with GM on a connected car. And so visibility without borders applies here as well, because what we do is we put our V-Stream technology, which is visibility, inside each slice. So now when you're looking, we're not only end to end, but now we're multi-network. We can see a slice for connected cars. There's gonna be SLAs and different things like that. And we can make sure things are measured and performing. At the same time, we could be looking separately with a, a V-Stream in, in a smart city slice. And today we've already been looking at phones and iPads and, and all of that. And so when you look at the edge, it's really about IoT, what you mentioned, the networking technology with SDN, which is really programming these slices uh, so that the networks are independent. And we're gonna play a major role in that. And it's, it's, we're gonna be assuring and securing what's happening you know, in these various virtualized networks at the edge. Yes, so, so you have a horizontal, I mean, it's like a multi, it's not even a three dimensional model. It's like, it's way more than three. So it's more than what humans can uh, conceive. So, but, but that, you know, brings also the issue of how you manage. So it's like, okay, you have all this information. So you have uh, location levels, uh, layers, uh, different applications, different slices different vendors, right? But then you need to, at the end of the day, come up with an automation plan so that you know exactly what to do and when. So you have to manage this whole yes. rich so of, environment. Yeah, that's really how, good. That, how do you do that? Yeah, that's automation, that's a really good topic. We could spend all day on that, but let me just give you quick insights into what we've been doing. So one of the things that we've done is we've made our software cloud friendly. We talked about multi-cloud, private, public, that was one, but we also made it automation friendly. What does that mean? So if you look at the industry, you'll hear the term APIs. What that really means is REST, right? People are publishing APIs so that you can do automation tasks. So we did the same thing. On our visibility component, there's a REST API to automatically start our visibility component. It can, there's a REST API to automatically configure our visibility component. There's one to automatically stop. And what we're doing is we're gluing that. So 80% of the work has already been by, done by NetScout to manage our own life cycle of starting ourselves, stopping ourselves, configuring ourselves. The 20% of the work that we've been doing, and I'll talk about some of the certifications we've got, is we've been gluing ourselves to an orchestrator. So we tightly integrated with VMware. In a VMware environment, it's fully automated, fully orchestrated. And what we did is we, we interfaced with our REST APIs with their orchestrator. At the same time, we went with Etsy Nano, and we went into Telefonica, and we went into the Unica Labs, and we certified with an open stack environment running OSM, which is the orchestrator for um, Etsy Mano. And so that's an open source project. And so when I say we're orchestration friendly, we're always doing 15, 20% of the work. And this is the part of the industry that is chaos is going on. You have ONAP from AT&T and a few other vendors, Etsy Mano really happening in, in Europe. You've got container companies like Kubernetes. You get vendors like Ericsson that have their own cloud manager, their own orchestrator. So our strategy is saying, hey, don't pick a winner. Just be cloud uh, and automation friendly. Have a standard set of APIs and then glue it. And that, that work is typically quick when we get involved with a customer. It's usually one quarter later and we're fully integrated from an automation perspective. That's great. So we sort of uh, ended up with uh, putting all, all of this uh, together, which is, you know, a huge to you challenge that uh, and that's how it's uh, taking on. That's great. Well, Bruce, thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts with us today. Yeah, it's been enjoyable. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, listening in. And uh, we will also, we also have um, a, a transcript of this interview so you can read it uh, um, afterwards uh, as well. Thanks a lot. Hey, happy holidays.